so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's 5am on May 9, 2021, and there's a flurry of activity at Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery as a brilliant pink and orange sunrise lights up the sky. An excavator is carefully slicing its way through a patch of dirt into the grave beneath. Bones are gently lifted into a brand new coffin, which is hoisted onto the shoulders of four pallbearers as two police officers escort them to a waiting vehicle. A team of police and forensics For over 70 years, the, the remains of the unnamed man, now dubbed the Summerton Cameramen from Cameron national Cameron. media stations watch on, film rolling, as the 72-year-old final resting place of the Summerton Man is exhumed. Over the past seven decades, DNA technology has improved dramatically, and South Australian police think they might finally be able to crack the case of the mystery man, found slouched on an Adelaide Beach seawall in 1948. Little did they know, they'd be beaten to the punch by a forensic genealogist and an Adelaide University researcher who've been painstakingly following leads in this story for a collective 15 years. You keep trying to find out how they related to each other and you move them around like a Sudoku puzzle. And then finally you find the consistent way they all fit together and the missing piece is the person you're trying to identify. Fast forward to 2020 and they have a name. They have a backstory. They know who the Summerton Man is. After 74 years, Australia's most baffling mystery has finally been solved. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, we're discussing the recent developments in the Summerton Man case, a breakthrough from the University of Adelaide's Professor Derek Abbott and US forensic genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick claims to have identified the man after decades of independent research. Colleen's a pioneer in the development of forensic genetic genealogy for solving violent crime and unknown person cold cases. She joins me today to talk us through their findings. Colleen, tell me about how you first became involved in the Summerton Man case. I actually had an email from Derek Abbott back in 2014, and he was doing a GoFundMe to try and get some money raised for some aspect of the case. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. And I wrote him back. And I figured, you know, he won't answer because you know, he's busy. And he did not. So then in 2015, I was in Adelaide, I was doing a book tour. And I contacted him and I said, Hey, you know, could we have lunch? Or can I meet you? I'd like to talk about this. And he took me up on it. We had lunch. And, you know, we kind of kicked some ideas around. And then we started working together. What did you think of the whole story? When you first stumbled across it? Or when you got that email and started reading into it? oh, I thought it was a weird story. You know, I'd like to help solve it. And, you know, I'm into weird stories and weird cases. So I was very intrigued and sucked in from the beginning. And this is your area of interest, isn't it? Your expertise is in unsolved crimes and cold cases. Well, I actually, I have a doctorate in nuclear physics from Duke. And I worked on lasers for NASA for a long time as an independent contractor. But my relevance, you know, I do cold case work and I do genealogy, I do DNA. I have worked many high profile cases. I've worked the Titanic baby. I've worked Abraham Lincoln, Amelia Earhart, a very famous plane crash called Northwest Flight 4422. I've worked Holocaust, a lot of Holocaust work. One of my Holocaust survivors was Alex Kurtzman. He died recently, but his family lives in Melbourne. I helped solve him and identify him. I've done military identifications, of course, adoption searches. But right now I'm doing a lot of cold case work. This is one of the higher profile cold cases I've been on, but there have been many others. But 
the ones I'd really like to tell you about, I can't because they haven't been announced yet. So you worked on the Summerton Man case for seven years. You would have spent countless hours on this. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I was helping him at first because some of the items in the suitcase apparently were American, and he wanted to know how popular they were or could I find ads for the shirt waist the man was wearing? Could I find ads for Juicy Fruit Gum? He had some of that, you know, to gauge the popularity in the United States compared to Australia. And where did you go from there? Did you find anything out in your investigation of those initial kind of things that you had to look at? Always just leads, just hints, just developing theories and discussing the Rubaiyat, for example, how popular it was. Which is the book of poetry that the Somerton man was found with. Yeah, but all circumstantial. Last year there was a dig, so they exhumed the body of the Somerton man. Was that a big moment for the pair of you? Yeah, well, it was kind of because, you know, Derek had petitioned the government of South Australia, the Attorney General, to exhume the man. I mean, He had been interested in that and approached them about that for a while. So when the new attorney general came in, you know, there was hope that that would happen and we would hope we would be involved in that, but they kept it very private. So we were disappointed, but, you know, I'm here in America. I have to let Derek kind of handle the people and the politics. So I was disappointed, but you can ask him. I think he was a little more disappointed than me. So what was it that eventually led you to your man? What were the main clues? I know that there was a person who it was, long thought, might have been related to the Somerton man. Well, there were several kind of interesting twists to the story. The first one was that, you know, Joe Thompson had a son named Robin. And it was always suspected that Robin was Somerton Man's son because they shared some unusual physical characteristics. His teeth, for example, Somerton Man was missing lateral incisors, which are the teeth right next to your middle teeth. Robin was also missing his lateral incisors. The Somerton Man was in good shape. Robin became a world-class ballet dancer. They had sort of a funny ear formation, both of them. And he was 18 months old. You know, the mystery kind of swirls around this nurse with a son. Nobody knows his paternity. So I'd say it must have been 18 months ago, two years ago, we decided to do an adoption search on this son to see who his parents were. And of course, genealogists do this using DNA every day. And we discovered that Robin was the son of Prosper Thompson, who became Joe Thompson's husband shortly after that. So he was not related to the Somerton man. So that didn't work. A couple of other things in the suitcase, there was some items labeled Keen, K-E-A-N-E, either Keen by itself or T Keen. And it always been a speculation that that was the man's name. Okay, back up 10 years. Derek visited the South Australian Police Museum. And while he was down there, he looked at the plaster cast of the man's death mask. And he noticed that there was hairs stuck in the mask, you know, as if they put a plaster on him and when they pulled it away, the hairs came with it. So he asked the police if he could have a few of those hairs. So Derek very carefully examine the hair to make sure that there's a certain characteristic. When you die, you get these brown bands around the bottom of your hair, and the hairs had the bands, so you know it was the person who was deceased. It wasn't a technician helping out. So he had these hairs, and he's done some experiments over the years, and now the technology has developed that you can actually get DNA from rootless hair. You don't need the root anymore. And I happen to know how to do that because, you know, I do stuff like this every day. So kind of conveniently, sort of the whole thing came together that I'm available. I'm working with him. I know how to do this. He's got the hair. And we did what we do on cold cases. We took that DNA and we made genealogy data out of it. It's the same as doing an adoption search. You have DNA from somebody you don't know who it is, and we have techniques to, you know, use a genealogy to identify that person. You upload your DNA to whatever website 
and you get a list of matches, people who are related to you either very closely, very distantly. So that's what we did. We had the DNA, we made genealogy data, uploaded it to that GEDmatch website, and I was expecting very distant relatives that perhaps connected in the UK generations ago. But the top match was a young man living in Melbourne, and he was close enough that we could build his family tree and son of a gun, but his great-great-grandfather was Thomas Keane. Which, of course, explains why T. Keane was written on some of the things found on the Summerton Man. But Thomas Keane... We knew his date of death. We knew he had a funeral. We looked in Trove. We looked in the newspaper articles. And Thomas Keene was not the Somerton man. But he had to have some connection. That could not be a coincidence. And in the whole story, when you look at Thomas Keene, his brothers, sisters, his aunts, uncles, big family tree, you come up with one person who does not have a date of death. And that is Thomas Keene's brother-in-law, Carl Webb. Thomas Keene was married to a woman named Frida Webb, and her brother Carl Webb didn't have a date of death, and he's the only one we could find. So we dived into Carl Webb to see what was going on with him, and it turned out he was married to a woman named Dorothy, and he was divorced. Officially, it was 1952. All right. But, you know, you read that divorce decree, and Dorothy is divorcing him for desertion because he's not there anymore. And also she describes her husband, you know, along the way. And it turns out he writes poems. He writes poems about dying. And he says the thing he'd really like to do, he can't wait to die. Death is going to be a relief, you know, something like that. And so, you know, you start to see a pattern emerge. That would be a man who would have a copy of the Rubaiyat, right? Now, we don't know, you know, if it's a natural death or, you know, he just passed away or whether he he committed suicide or, you know, he was killed. We don't know. But it sort of fits the whole ambiance of finding the right person. And so what we did was, if you do the genealogy, that young man I described was related to Carl Webb's father. You go to Frida, his great-great-grandmother, and then the Webb family is the connection. That's Carl's father. So we looked at Carl's mother, and we found somebody who was related alive to Carl's mother, and we got him tested. And so he was a match to the mother's side. So there we had mom and dad, and that normally that means you narrow somebody down to a group of siblings because they all have the same mom and dad and aunts and uncles, same genealogy. You rule out the sisters, and he had two brothers, and we knew their dates of death. Couldn't be either one of the brothers. It had to be Carl. So Carl Webb is the Somerton man. Mm-hmm. Was he Melbourne-based? Why was he in Adelaide? Do we know anything about that? No, we don't. There's so many pieces of the puzzle we don't know yet. One of the possibilities, they divorced or they separated in 47. He left, you know, in 47. She left early from the address. He lived there a while. He left. And it's possible we do know that at the time she put divorce decree in that she was living in South Australia. But it could be that she moved to South Australia and he went to go find her. That's a distinct possibility. Have you been able to talk to any of his living relatives and share this finding with them? How have they reacted? Well, you know, when we were doing this, we didn't tell anybody what we were doing because normally when you do a forensic case in our world, in our profession, you don't really want to say, hey, I'm looking for, and then fill in the blank. You just say, listen, can you help me? You're a distant relative of so-and-so, and and we're doing a forensic case. People are okay with that in general. I've almost never been denied, you know, a conversation at least. And so we didn't tell anybody. We just said, we'll let you know when the time comes. And of course we did. We send the emails out. And I think the reaction was being delighted between being delighted and being happy to assist all the way to kind of being surprised and kind of chuckling at the whole story. You know, we don't tell the names of the matches. We don't do that in our world. You know, we keep everybody private, but I want them out there listening to know how much we appreciate their cooperation. 
How did it feel for you and Professor Abbott after all these years to get an answer? Well, there's so many questions still open. That's the excitement. But you have a name. That's such a big get. We no longer have to refer to him as the Somerton Man. Yeah. It's like when you, you know, outside of a room and you can see through the keyhole and you see all these cool things, maybe, you know, a little bit in the room. And then you actually get in the room, you have like a candy store to all kind of interesting questions and, you know, things to pursue. We're hoping the police will help us, you know, dig out some of the story, whatever they have available. Of course, this is going back a long time, so we don't know what records are around. I mean, we did our best to look in the newspaper, collect what we could, but maybe, you know, maybe there are other records out there that are private that are in archives somewhere that the police can get that we can't. Is that the next step here? Because you guys think you know who the Somerton man is, but does that need to be kind of approved or like do the authorities need to kind of agree with you to get that ticked off or what are the next steps? This is a coronial case. The coroner is in charge because it's less than 100 years old. So the coroner really has to agree that we've made the identification. So we have to write a report and review it with them so we can have the official death certificate made out and signed. When do you expect that to happen? You know, I really don't know. I'm not that familiar with the Australian process. I will actually be in Australia in about a month, and I don't know if we're going to meet with the coroner. He has any questions, but I certainly will be willing to do that if he needs to, you know, get together in person. Lastly, I just wanted to ask, how certain are you guys? Is there any chance that you've gotten another wrong steer? How certain are you? 100%. It's him. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I've been speaking with forensic genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick about the new findings in Adelaide's Somerton Man case. Up next, you'll hear the full story of this previously unsolved case through Jesse Stevens' 2019 conversation with ABC journalist Fiona Ellis-Jones. It was the 1st of December 1948 when a man was found dead on Somerton Beach. Can you describe the scene? Well, it was the first day of summer. So think Adelaide, it's quite warm. It was very early in the morning. It was just after 6am. And there were a couple of local jockeys because back in the day, Somerton, Bright and Glenelg beaches used to be quite popular for horse races. So there were two jockeys, one by the name of Neil Day, who was travelling down the beach and they saw this man and they thought, that's a little strange. He's wearing a suit and he's quite well dressed and he's not moving. And they kept going with their ride and then on their way back, they saw that he was still there. And by this time, another local man had kind of gone over to see what was happening as well and they worked out pretty quickly that this guy was dead. And they phoned the local police and the police initially assumed that this was just a suicide. But as they started digging deeper, there were so many things that didn't make sense about this guy's death. What were the defining features about his his body? How would you describe the well, man? he was quite striking. He was a good-looking guy. Like I said, he was really well-dressed. He was middle-aged. He had a little bit of salt and pepper on the sides of his hair. His fingernails were clean. He had no calluses on his hands. So immediately they thought, well, this guy is not a tradie. He's not a labourer. He's not working on the ships. He is a professional guy. His shoes were absolutely immaculate, not a speck mm. of, of dirt or sand, as you would expect if he had been walking on the beach. He's Clothes are completely dry, so he certainly hadn't washed ashore. And they noticed a couple of abnormalities. For example, his toes that was discovered at a subsequent autopsy were oddly wedged-shaped. He was missing a whole lot of teeth and he had absolutely no identification on him, no wallet. But that wasn't the only creepy thing. All of the tags on his clothes had been cut off. Was that usual at the the time, that seems really bizarre. Are you talking about like the actual clothing mm. tags that say the, the clothing size? clothing tags, and- yeah. Well, it was odd. A lot of people, you know, with rationing after the war, they would recycle clothes and they would use a lot of clothes and wear hand-me-downs. But to have all the labels cut off, police thought were very strange. 
they kind of waited and waited and they did a lot of publicity locally because they thought someone's got to claim this guy, but nobody came forward. And was it obvious when they sort of did that initial autopsy to try and work out who this guy was and what happened to him, what his cause of death was? Well, no, and we still don't know. It was inconclusive. They assumed at the time that it was some kind of poison because he had no abrasions on his body. He had no cuts or bruises and it didn't look like he had died naturally or unnaturally. They were just totally stumped. The only kind of striking things that the coroner found, um, that the examiner found and the coroner concluded, was that he had a strikingly enlarged spleen, which was odd. And it looked like potentially the cause of death had been heart failure. But in terms of what brought on that death, there was absolutely no indication. So they put it down to some kind of poison that was undetectable at the time in 1948, 1949 to science. And were there any known last sightings of him on that beach or in the surrounding areas? There is a bit of controversy about this. A case of this magnitude attracts a lot of, I don't want to say conspiracies, but there is a lot of different thoughts on when he was last seen. But it's generally confirmed by most experts that he was seen in that exact position the night before his body was found. And a couple were walking along Somerton Beach, which is, you know, a a quiet stretch of beach, really. It's not like neighbouring Glenelg, which has a lot of foot traffic, but it was a nice evening and a couple reported seeing the man the night before and he waved his arm into the air and then slumped it back down. And they just assumed that this guy was a local drunk. But then ironically, one of the people who saw him the night before was also on the scene the next morning and went, that's weird. And there were a couple of other things that night. For example, the couple reported that there were mosquitoes all around his body and they thought, that's strange. This guy must be so out of it to not realise that he's getting massacred by uh, Mm. mosquitoes. Can you tell us about the suitcase that had been checked into Adelaide Railway Station? Yes. So this was the first major breakthrough for local coppers in Adelaide. And you can imagine that they would have been absolutely overwhelmed by the enormity of this case when nobody came forward. And they found this suitcase and they immediately were able to link it back to this man because all of the clothes in the suitcase also had their labels cut off. And there was also this tiny bit of waxed thread in the suitcase and they were able to match that to the guy's suit. It looked like he'd done a bit of a repair job on his pants and he'd used this very specific wax thread, which incidentally wasn't available in Australia at the time. It was an American thread. So that did raise a lot of questions that perhaps this guy was a traveller. But there was no identification in that suitcase either. There were a few like random things on his possession and in that suitcase. For example, on the body, they found a a second class ticket from Adelaide to nearby Henley Beach. They found an unused bus ticket as well, an aluminium comb, which was only also available in America. And they found some juicy fruit chewing gum, which wasn't readily available at the time in Australia, again, suggesting he might have been American. But When I first heard about the case, one of the weirdest things to me is that he had an army club, a packet of army club cigarettes, but inside the cigarettes were smokes from a different brand called Kensitas. And the thing is that the army club cigarettes were the cheaper brand and this guy carried around expensive cigarettes. So you'd think it would be the other way around if you were trying to fob yourself off as being, you know, of a higher class. So this raised a lot of suspicion, the contents both in that suitcase at Adelaide Railway Station and the contents on his possession. And he had a cigarette in his pocket, didn't he? On his lapel. He had a cigarette sitting on his lapel. Interestingly, the initial search of the body, they didn't find a packet of matches, although during the autopsy, they later discovered a packet of matches. So that was kind of raising a bit of scepticism as well. So would you say that with that that evidence, obviously he doesn't have a wallet or anything on him and then there's a suitcase that doesn't have a name on it, did it appear that this was a man who didn't want people to know his true identity? Potentially, yes, and things took an even weirder turn when they actually did an autopsy of the man's body and during that they did a second search of his clothes And the examiner found deep within a fob pocket, which is kind of, you know, that kind of coin pocket that you have Mm. in your jeans or your pants, deep within there they found something. And it was rolled up so tightly it appeared to be a little piece of paper. And the guy said in a later recording, he said that he had to pull it out with tweezers. It was so deep inside that fob pocket. And they unraveled this little piece of paper and it had the words, Tamam Shud. So you could imagine by this stage, the detectives, the reporters, everyone in Adelaide is just going, what does this mean? It um, it means 
the end, essentially, in Persian, in Farsi. So this just added a whole new dynamic to the case, which was by this stage starting to get quite a bit of traction, not just in Adelaide, but also in Australia. And the cops put out this search for where these words came from. And it was a local journal with the Adelaide advertiser who said, hey, if you look to the back page of this obscure book of Persian poetry called The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, you will find those final words, tamam should, meaning the end or it is finished. So then the search starts for this book missing its final words. And so did the police put a word out to say we are looking for this very specific book? They did put a word out and they eventually find the book, but they didn't have any success in identifying the guy. So initially before the Tamam Shud piece of paper, they put photos of autopsy mortuary photos of the guy and spread them throughout Adelaide, throughout the world, and they found nothing. They sent his fingerprints off, even to the FBI, Scotland Yard. No one had any record of who this guy was. There were a lot of people in Adelaide who came to the Adelaide Museum where his body was and said, you know, I think this is my long lost son, this is my dad, potential husband, but no one could match it up. And the case, until the discovery of the Tamam Should words, was really kind of at a wall. It wasn't until they found that piece of paper that somebody came forward and said, hey, I think I've got that book and it's missing the final page. Those little words have been torn. It was just a small book, like a pocket book. And the cop said, oh, yeah, okay, well, we want to talk to you, come to the station. And he said, well, I was actually parked near Summerton Beach that day, so the last day of November. And he's like, look, I had all my windows down, which wasn't unusual back, you know, 1948. And I reckon someone has tossed it in. And they said, well, this is six months later. Why haven't you come forward before? And he said, well, I kind of thought it was my brother-in-law's book. He kind of thought it was mine. Weird, but believable, potentially. You wouldn't go to the police if you found a strange book in your car. No. I mean, people have, you know, all sorts of stuff in their car. Yeah. So anyway, they matched that piece of paper to this book. They did all this forensic testing. They worked out it was exactly the piece of paper. So the assumption being that this guy was walking towards Summerton Beach threw the book into the car and then ended up dying on that beach. By this stage, the general thought was, well, this is suicide. This is a a suicide letter and this is a tragic death by his own hand on Somerton Beach. And then when they had a look at that book more closely, a number of other bizarre clues started to present themselves. What else did that book hold? Correct. It had two phone numbers. One was for a local bank. The other was for a local nurse by the name of Jo Thompson. Jo Thompson automatically became obviously a person that the cops wanted to speak to. They tracked her down. They knocked on her door, which incidentally was about 500 metres or so from where the Somerton man was found, like it's literally a two or three minute walk. And they knocked on the door and they showed Jo Thompson this photo and they said, do you know this guy? And she said, no. I've never seen him before. And they said, look, they said, can we take you down to the Adelaide Museum? Because by this stage, the body had begun to deteriorate. So they'd made like a plaster cast of the man's body. And they said, can we take you down here and show you this plaster cast? And the guy who made the plaster cast bust, a taxidermist by the name of Paul Lawson, later described her seeing this bust, denying that she knew him, but looking so physically shaken that he thought she was going to faint. But still she maintained, no, I don't know who this guy is. And there was a message or what seemed to be a message in there, wasn't there? Like they could make out some letters? There was the indentation of what appeared to be some kind of code. So it was this string of four or five lines long, like a long nonsensical string of letters. And police couldn't at the time make sense of what that alleged code was. In fact, no one has ever been able to crack that code. We've had experts from around the world who have dedicated so many hours to try and crack the so-called code. Most, and especially one who we'll hear from a bit later, seems to just be of the belief now that maybe it wasn't a code. It was some kind of aide de memoir or the first kind of few letters of a, of a shopping list. But they have had some pretty significant minds and some pretty significant computers in the last few decades try and crack that code, but to no avail. And did this woman, this nurse, have any connection to that book? Well, this is where things, I don't want to say start to get weirder, but they take another turn entirely. Because when the cops worked out they weren't going to get anywhere with Jo Thompson, who also goes by the name of Jeston, that was her nickname, 
when they worked out she was not going to budge on whether or not she knew this guy, they kind of changed tack a bit and they said, well, okay, let's just put it this way. Have you ever seen a copy of this book? And they showed her the Rubaiyat and she said, yes, I have seen that. And she said, I'm a fan of Omar Khayyam's poetry. I love that book. And they thought, okay, right, sweet, we're on to something. Have you ever given this book to somebody? And she said, yep, I've given it to a guy by the name of Alf Boxall, exactly that book, and I inscribed it inside. And they said, okay, Alf Boxall, where do we find him? So Alf Boxall was a Sydney Army lieutenant and Jo Thompson said she'd met him in Sydney a few years earlier when he was working at a place called Clifton Gardens Charter Bay, which is kind of near Taronga Zoo, near Mossman on Sydney's lower north shore. And they thought, right, that's it, we've cracked it. The guy on the beach must be Alf Boxall. But the only problem was Alf Boxall was still alive in Sydney and they tracked him down and he produced this copy of the Rubaiyat that was intact, it was signed by Justin and it still had those final words, Tamam Shud, in the back. And was she a woman who was married? Did she have a family? She did. She, I don't believe, was married at the time. She later married somebody by the name of George Thompson or Prosper Thompson and she had a little boy. And this little boy was born about 18 months before the man appeared on Somerton Beach. And for all intents and purposes, he was raised as George's son. But we've spoken to a number of friends of Jo Thompson who has since deceased, and they have said that she confided that George was not the father of this little boy, whose name was Robin Thompson. And Robin Thompson shared a number of rare genetic traits with the Somerton man. What were those rare genetic traits? So you might remember I said the Somerton man was missing quite a few teeth, which wasn't really unusual in 1948. But he also had this strange condition, a very rare condition called hyperdontia. And that is where his lateral incisor teeth were missing. And he had those kind of sharper teeth right next to his front teeth. And this is quite a rare issue in dentistry. And it's a highly hereditable genetic condition. And Robin Thompson also had these teeth. Add to that, Robin Thompson became a dancer, an extremely accomplished ballet dancer with the Royal Australian Ballet and the New Zealand Ballet. And there was a line of thinking that because the Somerton man had those wedged feet and these extremely highly developed calf muscles, that perhaps he was a travelling ballet dancer as well. And was there something about ears? Yes. So the ears of the Somerton man were quite distinct. And it wasn't until a professor later in the last 10 years was looking at the photos, and this professor's name is Derek Abbott, and he is considered the foremost expert on this Somerton man case. And Professor Abbott's line of thought when he came across Robin Thompson was, this has to be the son of the Somerton man. By this stage, Robin Thompson had died too. He only died two years later after his mum. But he was looking at the photo of Robin Thompson and he was looking at the photo of the Somerton man and he just describes it as it's springing out at him. He noticed that the proportions of the inner ear on the Somerton man were a little bit odd where we would normally have a larger Simba. His was the other way around. And that too is a highly genetic condition and Professor Abbott described that feeling where he saw that Robin Thompson also had that. So he took these two photos to an anatomist at the Adelaide University by the name of Professor Marche Hennenberg and he said, look, do these kind of ears look weird to you? Do these teeth look weird to you? And the professor said, yes, they are weird and he described the hyperdontia of the teeth and the, and the ears and he said that is a highly genetic feature and he said that it is highly likely that this is the son of the Somerton man. And you're saying that those conditions are rare. When they looked at the man who was meant to be his father, did he possess any of those traits? No, there is definitely not the same genetic resemblance between Prosper Thompson and the Somerton man as there is with Robin. I mean, Robin also had a lot of really obvious defining genetic characteristics with his mother, Jo Thompson, as well. You can see that the nose is clearly from Jo, but there is something eerie about seeing the photos up close of Robin and the Somerton man. There is clearly a very strong genetic link. Can you talk us through the sort of historical context? Because we're talking about the late 1940s, so we're going post-World War II 
What was happening at the time that might have been relevant to this case? Well, there was a lot of paranoia, obviously, after the end of World War II. And there was a lot of fears, particularly of, you know, reds under the beds and Cold War paranoia. And there was a lot of fear about refugees, especially those from Russia and Eastern Europe, of which there was a large program underway, obviously, an assisted migration scheme in Australia. So there was a lot of sensitivity. There was a a heightened uh, feeling of the unknown, especially in Adelaide, because, I mean, Adelaide is a key area in terms of military instalments. You've got Woomera in the north of South Australia, not too far away. So Adelaide was kind of a hub of intelligence and of spy activity and espionage. So that was certainly, I think, playing into the fears of Australians at that time. Obviously, having a guy on a beach with no clothing, no labels, and an association to a foreign book potentially containing a code, there were a lot of theories about who this guy was. I mentioned Alf Boxel before, who was working in defence. Interestingly, he did an interview with the ABC in the 70s and he was quizzed about what his role was with the Australian Defence Force. And it turns out that he was working in intelligence at that site where he met Joe Thompson that I mentioned in Charter Bay, Clifton Gardens, that was a hub of intelligence. In fact, there is a particular area called the Old Fort around Middlehead, and that was where the Australian Army Intelligence ASIO agency was based, and that is a precursor to ASIO. So there were a lot of questions about the role of Alf Boxel in all of this. Was he a spy? Was Joe Thompson a spy? Was the Somerton Man also a spy? Is there evidence looking back that there was spy activity around that time? Most definitely. Okay. Absolutely. And most of the historians that we've spoken to have said, yes, 100%. And the main source of which would have been Russian spies as well. Mm. And that would have been an enormous fear at the time because of the influence of communism and Australia wanting to push that out. Absolutely. So that played a huge role in the initial stages of the inquiry. And there are many people who believe to this day that the Somerton man was a Russian spy. But for me, that doesn't answer too many questions, especially when you look at the evidence that he was the father of Robin Thompson. I went into this story thinking he's got to be a spy. There are just Hmm. too many links here. But to me, an affair of the heart makes a lot more sense. I mean, what was he doing in Adelaide? He was obviously a stranger. There were so many indications that he was a stranger. But why was he trying to see Joe Thompson? Mm. Did he know he was sick? Was he going to die a natural death on the beach? And that explains the enlarged spleen and the lack of any kind of physical damage to his body, any violence. Or was it a death by force by Joe Thompson? But then it's bizarre because she denied knowing him, which then sort of lends itself to the theory that was she also a spy and therefore couldn't be connected to him in any way? Yeah. We spoke to a lot of people who knew Jo Thompson and they described her as incredibly cagey. She would often just pick up and move and that coincided a lot of the time when the Somerton Man case started getting traction or renewed attention in the media. Jo would just pick up and she would move. And a lot of people also said that she was hard to kind of get a handle on. I know her daughter, Kate, in an interview with 60 Minutes, described her mum as somebody who spoke Russian. She never knew her mum spoke Russian, but she overheard her once apparently speaking Russian. So she certainly doesn't discount the theory that her mother was involved in some kind of spy activity. And when interviewed on that 60 Minutes episode... She suggested that she did know the Somerton man, didn't she? Like yes. her mother, she gave some sort of insight into what their relationship might have been. Yes. I I don't think that there is any doubt at all that Joe Thompson knew, knew who the Somerton man was. And I don't think there was any doubt at all that he wanted Joe Thompson to be found because the way he disposed of that rubaiet with her phone number inside was so incredibly deliberate. It was almost as if he he wanted somebody to kind of go through his steps and put all these missing pieces together. The other question, therefore, has to be DNA. If they have a theory about who his son might be, why hasn't there been any sort of DNA testing? Well, there has been 
a little bit. So a couple of years ago, Professor Abbott, who I mentioned, who made that first link between Robin and the Somerton man, he has been so committed to this case and he has been pretty close to cracking it. So to kind of go back a couple of steps from the DNA, he, when he found out that both Joe and Robin had died, he went, well, is there any other living relative? And he thought, I wonder if Robin had any children. And he found out that Robin did. He had a daughter by the name of Rachel. And Rachel was actually adopted out by Robin and his then partner, Roma. And she too was a ballet dancer with the New Zealand Ballet. And Rachel was adopted out in New Zealand We've spent a lot of time together and she's described growing up in New Zealand as kind of not feeling like she fit in with her family and always feeling like there was something more to life. And it wasn't until she found out later in life that she was adopted that she said it all made a lot of sense to her. And she ended up finding her biological mother, Roma, and Roma lived in Brisbane at the time. She'd separated from Robin. And Roma and her became quite close and she said, come live with me in Brisbane. So Rachel picked up from Christchurch where she was living and moved to Brisbane. And it was around this time that they received a letter from Professor Abbott. And this letter said words to the effect of, uh, it was to Roma, I'd like to talk to you about this case. There was a clipping of the Somerton man and he suggested that perhaps Robin might have been the Somerton man's son. He didn't actually even use the word Robin. He just said, somebody who you've danced with in the past. And Rachel describes Roma as saying straight away, this this has got to be Robin. And this nurse referred to in this newspaper article, this is your grandma, Granny Jo. And Rachel says she was really sceptical at the time and she thought this was just a, a crazy, fanciful, you know, story invented by the professor. But she said, OK, let's let's meet with him and let's see what he, you know, what he wants and what evidence he has to back this up. And they met and they went out to dinner and within 24 hours, Rachel and Professor Derek Abbott were engaged to be married. <laughs> that is so weird. <laughs> it's weird. But you know what? Ten years on and they're still married and they've got three beautiful little kids and Rachel is absolutely as dedicated to, to Derek as finding closure to this case. Needless to say, there was a lot that was said at the time and a lot that has been said since about Derek and Rachel and about the reasons that, that they fell in love so quickly and, you know, if I can be so harsh as to say, did did Derek marry her for her DNA? And, and Rachel thinks that that's, you know, hilarious, as does Derek. And she said, well, look, I would have given it up willingly. You didn't have to marry me for that. But in kind of answer to your question, and that was the long way of getting to it, yes, Derek has utilised Rachel's DNA, in effect trying to find out a link to the Somerton man. Unfortunately, that hasn't been incredibly conclusive. So he's put her DNA on forensic genealogy sites and he has found quite a lot of unexplained relatives, so relatives that can't be explained through Roma's line. And they all live in America. So that is kind of weird and kind of telling, but they're so far removed. They're like five or six cousins. So in terms of finding a name and a family, immediate family of the Summerton man, that's not helped. But a couple of years ago, Professor Abbott managed to get a couple of um, hairs from that plaster cast bust that they made. And he had them tested in his lab, but unfortunately, they just weren't strong enough to yield any kind of specific information as to the Somerton man's DNA. And most of the experts are in agreement that the only way to get this information is to exhume the body of the Somerton man and test multiple different parts of his body, i.e. his hair and his bones, to see if DNA can be extracted. And then that DNA can be uploaded to forensic genealogical websites and a direct match to his family made and also obviously provide a name and some kind of closure to those involved in the case. And how likely do you think that is? I think it is increasingly likely. Professor Abbott has made two requests to the South Australian Attorney General to have the body of the Somerton man exhumed and both of those applications were denied on the grounds that public interest, public curiosity had not been reached and that that didn't go more you know, broadly ahead of scientific research. However, we spoke to the current South Australian Attorney General, Vicky Chapman. The decisions to not to exhume were under the former Attorney General, John Rao. And Vicky Chapman said to us, yeah, I'm open to this. And she granted approval to have him exhumed, provided that taxpayers don't 
pay for any of it. Derek Abbott reckons it'll cost about 20 grand to have the Somerton man exhumed and all the forensic testing and supervision done and then have his body buried again. And why do you think the answer matters so much? You say that it's there's a number of people involved and obviously there's an enormous amount of curiosity. What do you think it will mean to know who the Somerton man really is? Well, for Rachel and Derek, they've described it as so important, not only for closure for Rachel, but also for their children to know who their mum's biological grandfather is. And it's important to know, you know, even if we do get his DNA and we do find out even a name, then that's still not the end of the story because we need the backstory then. We need to find out what brought him to Adelaide in the first place. But it is definitely the closest opportunity that we have and the most likely that will yield answers to some of those questions that have endured for, you know, over 70 years. And like I said, sparked so many different conspiracy theories. I mean, this story is ranked, you know, in the top 10 of unsolved cold cases in the world consistently. It's one of the most baffling cases, definitely the most baffling case that I've ever come across. And it has, you know, almost like a cult following. So I think for a public uh, resolution, but for mainly resolution for Derek Abbott and Rachel Egan. And do you think that's why it has endured? Because as you say, it was, you know, more than 70 years ago. It's a case of a man that we couldn't identify at the time and still can't. Why do you think it is that there is such enduring fascination and interest in this case? I think because it is like a rabbit warren. Like when I first came to this case, I was intrigued by it. Well, I've been fascinated with it for the last 20 years. I remember as a little kid, my dad going, oh, look at this copy of the Rubaiyat. And I was like, what is that, Dad? That is so weird. And then uh, I guess sensing that I wasn't interested in the book, he was like, oh, it's got this really awesome backstory and told me all about The Summerton Man. I was so hooked and I've followed it really, really closely throughout my working career as a journalist. Every time, you know, that Professor Abbott would make another bid for an exhumation or he found a little bit of DNA that could potentially solve it, I was always so fascinated in it. But I think it is mainly because it is just such a complex story And then you, you know, I mean, you obviously add in the spy angle and you add in potential, you know, lover or why he was found on that beach. And then you add in this contemporary, dare I say, double love story with Rachel and Derek. It just takes the case to a whole level of um, weirdness. But I think the reason fundamentally that so many mysteries, you know, have continued to to linger about this case is because there's just so much that is unknown. Mm. I mean, in research for this case, for Mm -hmm. example, something that we discovered was that there were other deaths that were linked to the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, and these were never publicly linked. For example, one death in particular that really struck at us was a guy by the name of George Marshall, and he was found just around the corner from Chowder Bay, Clifton Gardens, a few years earlier on a bush track. And this is literally just near Athol Bay, which is pretty close to Taronga Zoo, so not far from Clifton Gardens, about five minutes' walk through a bush track. And he was found dead with a, you know, a couple of pill bottles beside him, and on his chest was an open copy of the ribeye of Omar Khayyam. Is there anything in that book that is giving us some clue as to why it might connect these deaths? Not really. I mean, I've read the book pretty closely. I have a copy here. I can show you, (laughs) Jessie. But it's been described to me by academics as a book of Persian love poetry, although a lot of the readings in it are quite sombre. You know, while it's hard because it's poetry, it's not explicit, but it does seem to touch a lot on the afterlife, potentially suicide. But it was generally considered at the time as a book given between young lovers. And wasn't there a woman who came forward years later with an ID card of some sort? Yes. So this is quite bizarre, if you didn't think the rest of it was bizarre. (laughs) A woman wrote in to Professor Henneberg, who is the guy who did that, he's a biological anthropologist who did those facial comparisons between Robin Thompson and the Somerton Man, And she said, look, I've just been going through my dad's old possessions. Um, He's just died. And I found this random ID card in among all the family photo albums and possessions. And I can't pick this guy. I have no idea who he is. And it seems really out of place. And she said, I'm wondering, is this guy the Somerton man? He looks kind of like a young Somerton man. And if you look at the picture, he really does. And Professor Marche Henneberg said, sure, send me the card. I'll have a look at it. I'll do some modelling. 
And he said that, yeah, he thinks this guy is a Somerton man. On the card, it says the name is H.C. Reynolds and it says he was born in 1900 and his occupation is listed as British. It's like a kind of card that was issued to foreign seamen at the time. And how about the ears and the, those sort of genetic it's hard markers? To, yeah, well, it's hard to see because the, the picture's black and white. It's obviously from so long ago. But the ears seem to be there. And not only that, there's this facial mole on his cheek that is in an identical position and exactly the same size as a mole that the Summerton man had on his face. So this obviously raises so many questions as to why her dad, who we should say she was long estranged from, so she couldn't ask him and he just died, had this ID card. We know that her dad spent a lot of time around Summerton. They were local to the area. So it does make sense. A lot of the experts are very sceptical about this, Professor Abbott especially, and also the former cold case investigator on the case, Jerry Feltus. They don't believe that H.C. Reynolds was the Summerton man. I did a fair bit of research on this guy and I tracked down one H.C. Reynolds who did serve a few years on a ship in New Zealand and he was born in the same time period. His name was Horace Charles. Potentially it could be the same person, but this particular Horace Charles died in Tasmania in the 50s. So it doesn't add up unless there is another H.C. Reynolds who was born exactly the same time period. But I haven't been able to track that down. So if anybody out there can work it out, then um, that would be fantastic. We hope you enjoyed this episode of True Crime Conversations. If you did, please let us know by leaving a review in your favourite podcast app or by sharing the episode with a friend. This Mamma Mia podcast is hosted by me, Gemma Bath. Our sound design is by Rhiannon Mooney and my executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you have a case you think we should cover next, get in touch with us. Send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au. And if you want unlimited access to all Mamma Mia content, why not become a Mamma Mia subscriber? Subscribers get access to every podcast, exclusive videos and all the great articles on Mamma Mia. For more information, there's a link in our show notes.